I had resigned in April of 2021, I took the role as an undercover journalist to work for Project Veritas. And um, that I basically made a promise with God to, um, you know, get my Pfizer footage back. We are joined today by Justin Leslie, who is a whistleblower and now undercover journalist, formerly a Pfizer. Would that be a fair description, Justin? Um, I've had multiple job titles over the last three years. I was, you know, Pfizer scientist turned, you know, I was a whistleblower there and then turned investigative and undercover journalist, uh, working in the alternative media for James O'Keefe. And then now I'm a whistleblower again on the whole entire situation of really what happened to me. Um, and I've turned myself into like a co-producer of, uh, the documentary Project Whistleblower, which tells my story over the last three, three and a half, four years. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't, I was trying to figure out how to word it. So, you know, it's, um, there's a, a great lawyer online called Robert Govea, and he has a show that he calls Watching the Watchers. So, are you whistleblowing the whistleblowers? In a way, <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, that's a good way to put it. I've said that before. So, you know, you're not wrong in, in any way. I'm, I basically investigated the investigators in a way, you know, um, based off of what had happened to me during my original whistleblower experience. Okay, so now you started out as a scientist at Pfizer, which is not exactly a lightweight gig, far beyond my comprehension or ability. And while you were there, you were working on a substance, and I'm assuming that you didn't like how things were going or something was wrong with what was being manufactured, and that led you to want to become a whistleblower. How did you do that? So never mind the, the thing itself. That's all in your documentary. But how did you go about becoming a whistleblower? Great question. Um, so, you know, I took this scientist role for Pfizer in March of 2021. And if everyone remembers, you know, the, the, it's a famous substance, right? We'll, we'll call it, you know, I'll call it the hokey pokey or like the toxic poison bomb. But um, that injection was going into a lot of people like millions. And then it turned out being billions of people on a, on a worldwide scale. Um, in March of 2021 is right when I joined. So it was already happening. A lot of people had taken, you know, both injections, like the, the series of the two shots, um, or, or it was at least coming down the road. And I took this position to see it for myself, uh, and see like how legit everything really was. And I was paying a lot of attention to like the alternative media news cycles and, and, you know, witnessing, like, I mean, I remember the first nurse who like took the Pfizer, you know, the Pfizer injection and like collapsed like within, I I think it was five, 10, 15 minutes tops. Yeah. So I, I don't remember her name, but she, she had collapsed. And so, you know, working on that injection, you know, to me was really, I had, I had to just do the right thing, you know, so getting to, becoming a whistleblower. Um, it was it was really interesting, Eric, because, you know, I didn't trust anybody except for like myself. And then, you know, I re had reached out to Project Veritas in like late August, and then I connected with them in September of 2021. So this was right around the time that vaccine mandates were basically coming down on a worldwide scale, especially in the United States, but, you know, all other countries were, were trying to mandate this thing on, on the masses. And I just thought it was a horrible, horrible thing that was happening. So I said, you know, I have to do something. And so Project Veritas is um, renowned for being a investigative journalist organization that tells truth, their motto is be brave, do something. And so um, there were a series of videos that were coming out around that time when I reached back out to them in September uh, with Jody O'Malley, who's an HHS whistleblower. She's a nurse. 
then there were some undercover investigations that happened with Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson, uh, basically exclaiming like, you know, explaining don't, yeah, I wouldn't take the shot if, you know, I had a kid, uh, or I wouldn't give, give the vaccine to a kid. Um, so, you know, that was what really inspired me to reach out to Project Veritas. So how did you reach out? Did you like drop an email through the Proton or whatever it was? Email through Proton and then I uh, got on the phone with them and they were really excited to work with me and they gave me cameras and, you know, equipment the next day that I got. Did off you reach out to anyone else prior to that? Other news organizations? Yes. No. No, now okay. I I was like, there's no way I'm gonna reach out to Fox. You see, you know, there's no, I didn't see any point. You know, I was like, there's no way they're gonna take the story. Like I, you know, felt like I knew how corrupt they were already. So it's like, what's the point of of doing that, wasting my time? I might as well go straight to this investigative journalist group that you know does these like sting operations and seems that they're telling the truth. Now. Listening to, I I get the impression, and I'm not sure if it's accurate or not, when you went in, you were mentally prepared to whistleblow, like as if you, you didn't necessarily trust Pfizer as an organization, even when you were hired from day one. Yeah, you know, you're, you're spot on. I mean, I didn't go in there with like the direct intention of like, I have to be a whistleblower, but I knew that there was malfeasance, malpractice criminal negligence happening. Um, and I wanted to basically go see it for myself. And I saw being offered this position as a contractor to work for them as a scientist, as a really unique opportunity, literally presented by God, you know, like, I was probably the only person in this situation in the in the world that was gonna have this opportunity if, you know, since I felt like there was wrongdoing, that that's why I went and did what I did, you know, so it wasn't like 100% I'm going to be a whistleblower. But, um, you know, I had already wrote in writ, uh wrote a, um, a master's student paper on COVID-19 uncovered, calling out the entire agenda. Okay. Um, I, I think it's important to know people's intentions and thoughts um, going into something. So now I'm a big nerd, we're getting into the day you get equipment from Project Veritas. Can you describe it? What equipment did you have? Because people are curious, you know, what do you go they, in with? There was, um, I wish I had an example to show you, but they gave me a camera bag around, you know, this big. I don't know if the people on the audio recording will see, but it was a, it's a mini camera bag, a little black camera bag. And then they gave me, um, you know, like button cameras. They gave me coffee cups, they gave me phone cameras, um, all for surreptitious recording. And, you know, I being a 23 year old young man, I'm like, okay, cool, let's go. You say, okay, uh, I got a button cam on or whatever. You're wired up however you are, and you just turn it on and you just leave it on all day. How, how do you do this? Depending on the battery pack, it would last four hours or even eight hours or, or like seven and a half, eight hours. So that's basically a full day of work. So um, what I was doing is if I had the opportunity to obtain information from any of my colleagues that, you know, might be incriminating in a sense, um, you know, I had made sure that I was, was, was rolling and it was simple enough where I could put my hand in my pocket and basically press the, press the power button and then it immediately goes. The power button, does it depress and hold? Or how do you know that it's actually on or you gotta off? got to hold it for five seconds. And then it turns the whole uh, DVR battery pack on. Because I would worry, wait, did I turn that on or off? Oh, shoot. Did well, I, that's did a, I have I, to turn it on again? You know, and, and then well, accidentally turn it I off. Would forget, sometimes I would forget, am I rolling? Am I not rolling? And then I'd be like, okay, I got to run to the bathroom to see if this thing's even on. You know, because okay. I, I mean... There were a few times I might have like slipped it out like at my desk and like literally, you know, figure it out right there. But it was definitely a risky thing to be doing, you know, and if these kind of details are interesting, like if there's a bright light and it's sticking through your slacks or whatever, if you're in the room, you know, are people going to see that? Oh, there's a light there. 
Well, I I made sure that my pants like weren't see through or anything, and they there yeah there was a light like that's on the battery pack, but it's not light and you know it's not bright enough to like really make a glare or you know get through the pants and you know because it would it would be through you know in my in my pant pockets and then I even cut holes into my pant pockets so that the wire itself could go up through the inside of my pants and then it would be more discreet to get up through my shirt if it, if I was using the the uh the button cam that day I wasn't going to I wasn't doing it every single day um with the button cam it was you know probably 3 out of 5 days if I went into the office um and then other days I would use like a coffee cup or how did that work so the coffee cup um, you know, I don't have one with me, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's literally, it looks like a Starbucks, like black coffee cup and a reusable one. Mm-hmm. Um, and all you have to do is make sure it's charged and then you just, you take the cap off and then there's really a circuit board under it. Mm-hmm. And, and then you press and hold for about five seconds for the thing to turn on. Um, and then bang, bang, boom, you're recording. And Can you drink coffee out of it? You can, but you have to be really careful with the amount of actual liquid that's in there, and you mm-hmm. have to be careful of the temperature of it because you can actually destroy it if it's too high up, and if it's too hot, it'll it'll I, not burn it, but it'll cause the battery like to you know. So what, what was it? it was a cup kind of like this or something? Some sort of a reusable. Yeah, something like this. Too okay. even. Um, this one's probably too big for the cap to actually fit on. It it works well with um like just your typical like paper coffee cup, and then you just oh. stick it on there. Okay, so you could have a cold liquid in there. It, it doesn't matter. But I'm, yeah, I'm asking you because could literally you could also walk around with nothing in there and just or or mm-hmm. put a put a little weight almost like I used to forget uh, like an oven mitt almost like a little mini oven mitt it's perfect to just squeeze in and put into there and so it's heavy enough so that you're holding it and it won't like fall over because the coffee coffee battery itself is relatively heavy so you know the cup could fall over and then you know it well that's why i was asking about um having a liquid in it where you can actually drink because there has to be a psychological factor of what you're doing I mean, you you are in there, and let's be honest. What is the difference between whistleblowing and corporate espionage to a company? So what I'm saying is if you get caught with this equipment while you are doing it, they could think that you're you know doing espionage. They could pro- possibly have you arrested, as far as I know. Um, well, with my whistleblowing situation... It's a, I look at it as, as a crime against humanity of what has happened and how people have been dying and severely injured from this injection that I was working directly on. So, you know, I don't have any malice or, or, you know, ill intent towards anybody that, you know, I was, I was, you know, obtaining information from, but Um, you know, I just felt called to by God to literally do this, you know, and I felt like I was a one of one type situation where, you know, I, it it was, it was me or nobody. Were you scared though? Oh, for sure. I mean, but I also felt, you know, I felt that I just had to do it scared. Now, how how did you, how did you mitigate that? I mean, where did you have times that you were not wired up or were you always wired up? So that way you would be consistent. I mean, there were some days I'm pretty sure that I didn't go in and like didn't have any intention to really, you know, obtain information. But um, yeah, I mean, dealing with it, I just I kind of got used to it. You know, it it was literally like my full time job was like working at Pfizer. My second full time job was being an undercover. Now, how long was this period where you were um, collecting information, we'll say? Late September and through early December, like, or you could say late November, early December of 2021. So about two, two and a half months. Now, did you leave the company on your own? Um, 
like like your contract ended or something you mentioned you were a contractor or my contract what went to happen i ended well i ended the contract myself um what had happened was you know i was obtaining the information that i obtained and then i um you know it's really some like life-changing bombshell information that if released to the public they would have it would have increased vaccine hesitancy on a worldwide scale and so you know that's where i point to crimes against humanity like the there are actual like conspiracies laid out in in from what is said from my managers and then just the aiming of the fda with nick warren it's it's really um it's like bombshell stuff you know and everyone says like james o'keefe he's releasing these bombshells well i had the biggest whistleblower story probably ever to give to him and the timing of it was perfect in the sense of it would have changed the vaccine agenda in late 2021 for the masses. You know, I mean, if people were getting injected, they would have stopped getting the booster or if they were, you know, getting squeezed into a mandate, they weren't going to have to really get mandated to take it because they could have used my story. Like, look at this Pfizer scientist. He's saying that this is, this is toxic. This is not safe, not effective, et cetera. Uh, on that front, okay. On, on that front, um, I, I know um, Robert Barnes pretty well, and he's been on multiple times. Um, and I'm really good friends with Viva Fry. Robert Barnes represented Brooke Jackson, who I believe is a Pfizer whistleblower. Did you consider going to um, a Robert Barnes or Children's Health Defense or an organization such as that? who are actually suing versus the uh, Veritas route. Well, so I've been in contact with Brooke's current lawyer um, since I released this information, uh, released my documentary. Um, And I did reach out to Children's Health Defense during my time at Pfizer, and they never emailed me back. And um, one thing to point out is, I mean, I was a naive 23-year-old young man, and I was way too trustworthy of Project Veritas. You know, the situation is unprecedented to, you know, give somebody the inform, you know, give me the equipment and trust me with the equipment and to have me obtain the information that I was obtaining every single day, just about. Um, And I was too trustworthy of them, giving them the SD cards, giving them all of the video footage without keeping any of it for myself. I was just handing it to them. I said, I hear you go. Like, this is this is the golden ticket, you know, like. Okay, so right? let's go over that. Let's go over that because uh, I, I want to, you know, cover the whole process. So you, you were collecting SD cards every day and that, that's how the information is stored in whichever device you were using, uh, SD or, or micro SD, which. Uh, I mean, they would, they have this like, what is it? These black like chip things almost that you put the SD card. So maybe they were micro. Micro. Okay, they're micro. Yeah, but that they're makes sense because micro. of small equipment. Um, yeah, they must have been micro. Uh, a normal SD card's a little bigger than a postage stamp. Yeah, so they were micro. Okay. Um, now, you would collect them. You say you turned them over. Did you meet with somebody physically or or mail them? How how did that work? I mean, yeah, how they reported. Project Veritas was um, keeping a journalist like on like tabs on me, basically 24 um, seven. They, they, and I mean, if it wasn't 24 seven, it was five days, five days a week, pretty much. Um, when they knew I was going on the inside, obtaining information, if I had an important meeting, there was a journalist who was hanging out at a hotel room, like, 15, 20 minutes from where I was at. Hmm. Now, were they instructing you at, on, you know, hey, um, we could really use this or, hey, could you do this? Um, that's an interesting question. And it, there's a huge gray area with that, Eric, because a lot of the time they would say like, oh, if I were you, I would ask this or if I were you, I would ask that. Or I, if I were you, I would try and get something like this. They wouldn't explicitly say, we need this. 
we need that most of the time. There was one meeting where I had with um, a producer and, um, you know, I'm going to leave names out of all this uh, interview, but there was a group Zoom interview where this was like early November at the time of 2021. And they were basically, they were getting ready to release my information is what it seemed. And they wanted to basically do a follow up as best that they, as best that, you know, have me do a follow up as best that I could and obtain like whatever else I could get, you know? So they were like brainstorming with me, like, Oh, what if you could get this on like Ivermectin or this on, you know, Joe Rogan, Aaron Rodgers, like what's being said there, you know? Oh, can you get more information about how Pfizer is the gaming, the FDA, you know, like information like that is, what they were suggesting they weren't maybe not explicitly telling me like oh we need this but how about the reverse were, how about that? how about the reverse like oh we don't really need information on that like were you were you encouraged to look for certain things but maybe not look for other things no i mean they were pretty much fair like anything that i was able to get they were willing to look at okay Okay, interesting, interesting. So, and you would, what, go to the hotel and drop this off? Or, like, meet up outside of, you know, meet up outside the campus. Um, it was mostly, like, a, the hotel situation, though. Yes, 100%. Um, Do you were kind of a spy. I mean, this is like a spy-type scenario, right? You're, you're, well, you have a handler, and you have equipment. You're turning the information yes, over I, to your handler. I had handlers, 100%. The journalists were my handlers. And, I mean, Eric, we could get into the conspiracy world, but this whole thing itself is potentially like a or military intelligence investigation. Well, and I want to get into that. I, I, I think that this is something – look, we just read stuff, and we're going, oh, look, that happened. Oh, look, that happened. But – there are real people involved too, and there's a real process involved too. And I believe you're involved with a really famous um, viral video that went out where you were having, I don't know if it was a date or just a lunch or what, what, what kind of expectation there was in the um, meeting that you were having in a public place with somebody from Pfizer. With Jordan Walker, you're saying? Yes. So to preface for the audience, um, I wanted to I wanted to make sure that your audience understands this, that I met James in December of 2021, and he had offered me employment as a journalist. He said, I can't release your whistleblower story due to like, you know, recording consent law due to, you know, all of these reasons. And my big argument was, well, why did you have me do this in the first place? You know, if you were just going to pull the rug out from under me due to these excuses, you know, waste my time, waste your journalist time, waste potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of donor funds on the investigation just to pull the rug on it and say, oh, I can't do this with you. Sorry, but I'll offer you employment. So that's that's how I end up getting offered a position. And, you know, backtracking to what I was saying earlier, I was naive, not holding on to any of this information myself. I was way too trustworthy. So I had obtained a story that could expose crimes against humanity, but I had given it all away. And so I saw this job offer as an opportunity, essentially, to go get my information back. And so that's what happened. And so, yes, it takes about six or seven months for me, once I take the position, I resigned from Pfizer in April and I took the, I took slash applied for uh, the Project Veritas undercover journalist role. And they wanted to interview me obviously right away. I mean, I basically got recruited by James and the journalists that I was working with to go work for them because it was like the next best thing, I guess. You know, they were like, throwing me a bone in the sense of, I don't know, they, they, maybe they felt bad for me, but I mean, maybe they also wanted to pull me away from Pfizer, you know, and could they, could they also be protecting you? And I'm, I'm asking this legitimately. Remember earlier, I asked you about corporate 
um, espionage. And if there is a two-party consent problem in that state or whatever, I mean, has Pfizer threatened you? Have they come after you in any way? Could they, um, if let's say this information, you know, I understand you're, you're just, you know, how you feel, but there, there still are very real legal considerations. And I have a feeling that Pfizer can afford some lawyers. Well, we will see what happens if they want to come after me. Um, I'm, I'm not hiding anything, you know? So, um, you know, the truth is not afraid to be investigated is what I like to say. Um, so, you know, I think it would be really interesting, Eric, because if they do want to come after me, it'll just be more, more gas on the fire of the story, you know? Um, because I'm, I'm not afraid to tell the truth, you know? And I, I line out how like, our whole entire medical allopathic system itself is entirely corrupted. And I bring up how virology itself is in question to be pseudoscientific. And if it is right, which to me, you know, I've done research on this for over two years now, reading articles, reading FOIA requests, things of that nature, such as Christine Massey out of Canada, where she's asked for direct purification and isolation of not only SARS-CoV-2, but many other viruses around the world in Canada and like the CDC, the WHO. She's asked over 220 health organizations about, you know, can you prove that SARS-CoV-2 or any of these other viruses such as H1N1, H5N1 actually exist in, you know, a purified isolated sample. And they cannot prove that. They don't give her anything from these FOIA requests. Um, so she has all this information on her website and, you know, there's, there's countless, um, articles and information that, uh, I could talk about, but that's one that I love to bring up as it's a simple thing to understand and to see, you know, all you have to do is go on her website and see what she's asking. It's getting to the root of like the scientific method itself and like if if it's being followed with like how virology itself was started. And so, you know, it's this might be something new that your audience is hearing. And I just encourage everybody to look into it, watch the, the, the documentary. I bring it up a handful of times. And I mean, that is what I'm standing on as well in the sense of truth, Eric, is that, you know, I from a Pfizer scientist perspective, have come across this information that virology itself is a potential pseudoscience. And so if this is proven to be true, which in court it is, it is, you know, Stefan Lanka and other people have won court cases because no one's able to prove that the, the vi virus exists, that everything else is null and void. So we're essentially looking at massive racketeering fraud that is being exposed. And so, you know, if they want to come after me for corporate espionage, just because I saw wrongdoing, um, you know, it's, it's a definitely interesting conversation. Um, but, you know, I know that I'm standing on the truth and I'm not afraid of being investigated in any way, you know? Okay. So where we are now though, is um, you've kind of pivoted and, you were whistleblowing on Pfizer with Project Veritas. Now you're <clears throat> essentially whistleblowing on Project Veritas or the O'Keefe Media Group because there is no Project Veritas, from what I understand. Didn't they close shop ultimately? They're technically still open right now. Um, but I wanted to also, I totally like glanced over your last question of the whole Jordan Walker situation. Um, Yes, that story itself went viral, like 50 million views. And I sat down with him um, under the guise of like a honeypot situation where I had to pretend to be gay. You know, I'm not gay. I'm a straight man. And, you know, I pierced my ears the whole nine yards, like made myself look more effeminate. And um, he was in one of the New York campuses in like New York City where, you know, I was up in Massachusetts. And so I had no connection to him from like my time at Pfizer. And so, 
you know, the way it works out is I met with him on a dating app and we just met organically and went out on two meetings uh, or dates, you know, like for me, they're meetings for him, they were dates. Um, and so he said, you know, Pfizer's mutating COVID and that, you know, he also elaborated on how um, there were problems with the menstrual cycles happening. So, you know, that story went viral and that is where, um, you know, that that's where it kind of, I had the epiphany of like this, this story is so big. Um, I'm not here to tell people what to think. I'm just sharing my perspective. And after that story had went out and it, you know, affirms virology and affirms that these viruses can be mutated into a really dangerous like bioweapon and and it's you know you have to be afraid um it it didn't sit right with me because i felt like it was affirming all of that on a subconscious level when this guy was i mean he was potentially eric just saying these things to impress me you know like that that is a reality of the situation like yes he said these things to me but when james sat down with him he also like freaked out and he said I'm literally a liar. And so, you know, okay, he broke so my iPad. On that, you said that they, he was saying them to impress you, which, I mean, you're collecting information. I'm I'm sure that you were working it a little bit. Um, was he drinking? Uh, anything going on? He was drinking a little bit. He would, didn't get, like, blacked out drunk by any means. He had maybe... I think max two drinks during each meeting. I think the first one he had one. And then this, you know, this was like two years ago now, or, you know, you know, he had one, maybe two drinks on each meeting, which, you know, yes. Like when, you know, when you, uh, when you drink, you, your lips might get a little loose and you might spill the beans on some actual, trade secrets maybe or maybe he was just trying to impress me it's it's hard to tell you was know, he exaggerating but, um maybe i mean was he making the whole thing up i'm not sure um he was you know basically saying that pfizer's mutating covid and talking about how they're they do these like monkey dilutions you know serial dilutions with monkeys which really doesn't make any sense um, and he also himself is in mRNA scientific planning and is not in any research and development. No. So w what you recorded, <clears throat> you, you mentioned there was two dates and I'm obviously clueless. I, I thought there was one date. I did not know that there was two. There were two. And then the, there was also a third meeting with the one where James sits down to ask him this, you know, basically we call it a surprise interview and, he sits down with him and asks him about the information that his undercover journalist, me, obtained. How much of this were you that was released was on the first or the second or the third? Or I mean, how did that transpire? I mean, did you go right in? Hey, let's talk about this stuff, or did you talk about sports or something? The first one, the first meeting, I refrained from asking him anything about work for the first like 40 45 minutes and like i would i was known for um you know i was like still a rookie or a green belt like someone that was like new to undercover journalism in a way but i knew that this meeting was you know really important because it's a guy from pfizer and so um i refrained from asking him about work at all for the first like 40 minutes just because i felt like it was going to be important to hold back, hold back the reins in a way. And then once he started bringing up work is when I started asking him questions about it, you know? And so just one thing led to another and he started talking about, you know, Pfizer mutating COVID. He brought up the Wuhan lab and, you know, he thought that's how this whole thing started. And, um, you know, there was, there was a there was more that I even should have been asking if you know I was like a good undercover journalist um, where I should have been asking him more about the Boston Consulting Group that he came from um, from he he went from Boston Consulting to Pfizer and he's actually connected to uh, papers where Boston Consulting 
has you know given this information to hospitals like around the world as to the COVID-19 uh, treatment protocols, which they recommend hydroxychloroquine, they recommend uh, remdesivir, which I mean, if anyone has read about remdesivir and like come to understand what it is, it's one of the most like toxic medications out there, you know, it causes liver and kidney failure, like organ failure itself, you know, so um, that is one of the reasons that we were seeing such a surge in deaths is it, it was linked to this COVID-19 protocol, um, the treatment protocol. And, you know, when you have a fraudulent PCR test that is giving all these false positives, like someone might just have a cold or not feel that well, but they test positive for COVID and then boom, you get thrown into the hospital and then boom, you have a respirator on, you're getting remdesivir. And it's just a recipe for disaster and ultimately death, which, you know, combined with fear is, is why we were seeing such a huge increase in, in um, mortality and people dying during COVID. Fair enough. Now, <clears throat> that had to be awkward. You, you just said that, um, you know, earlier, you, you're not gay, you were playing a part. And that that goes a little bit beyond um, I mean, I, I would probably struggle. I'm also not gay, even taking out a, a female and trying to lead her on that would, that would, that would be very awkward for me. So, I mean, how does that work? How, how do you navigate that? It, it can't feel great. Um, months of doing the thing of, you know, just literally doing the thing as in doing undercover uh, investigations and doing them on meetings with gay men or queer men or like bisexual men. You know, I was, this wasn't my first rodeo, you know, I had done it multiple times. Um, and I hadn't really gotten like a big bombshell story yet, you know, by any means, this was, this was my first, first go around first big story. Um, I had gotten one story in Philadelphia, um, and I was working on another story, for my Ed Camp story, which is in Long Island, um, which I also include in the documentary. Um, but that was like a long investigation. And this whole Pfizer story was like smack dab in the middle of that. So this was my first like, you know, is this all for Project Veritas? Yes. 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 And so, um, I mean, the so whole you were thing. working multiple stories. That's um, yeah. Uh -huh. Journalists were expected to work on multiple stories. But were you on their payroll? Yeah, well, I I had gotten offered the job after um, I had resigned in April of 2021. I took the role as an undercover journalist to work for Project Veritas. And um, that I basically made a promise with God to, um, you know, get my Pfizer footage back. Now, okay, because this is all, you know, this is... Um new to me on that was that something that they trained you to do or encouraged you to do saying hey you know what um you have a look i'm, I'm guessing that that it kind of went down saying you have a look and uh it might be very effective or this you know, particular group of people may respond well to you or is it something you came up with on your own um it's probably like a mix of both in a way i mean there's no like firm way to like affirm that but the thing is with these dating apps eric is when one of the easiest ways to obtain quote subjects right or people that you're looking to get a story on is through these dating apps bumble tinder hinge you name it i mean i didn't use grinder you know, people are like, oh, were you on Grindr? I'm like, no, I was not actually. But, you know, I could have been on it. And so when I was using these apps, right, and the the females that were undercover journalists as well, you know, were very successful in getting these stories. A lot of their most successful stories, Project Veritas and at O'Keefe Media Group, is through these dating apps. And the reasoning behind that is simple that, it's really like you're not going to be expecting the person you're sitting across the table from to be an undercover journalist slash like an operative, right? Like 
you know, you're like, oh, come on, like one in a million, that's actually going to happen to me, right? It's a honey well, trap. Let's be honest. It's just, oh, it's, it's honey, it, trap. honey, honey trap, and you're getting honey potted, you know, to, you know, and once you get good at it, you know, and I mean, the, the journalists that I used to work with, they were very good at it and able to, you know, the, the females would be able to get um, gentlemen to spill the beans on almost, you know, on a lot. And so, but my situation was when I had my dating apps, I allowed it to be, you know, anyone can like me, right? So it could be a dude, it could be a woman, it could be a transgender person. Like that's what, that's what it, it was all fair game, you know, because the ratios of men to women that were liking me was absurdly high on the men's scale and low on the women's scale. And I don't know why other than I think there's just like a lot of gay dudes on these dating apps. I'd say there's more men, period, gay or yes. not. I'm just yes. guessing. Yes. And so what my whole – the whole thing with these dating apps is you just go through – um these job titles, you know, that's really what you're looking for, or you're looking for some hint that this person has some high up, high end job that could lead to a story in a way. So um, that's how it worked out with Jordan Walker. He's, he had Pfizer director as his, his job title. And so, you know, that, that the rest is history, right? Like, you know, I, I connected with him and went on the two meetings and then there's the surprise interview and then the whole thing went viral. Wow. Um, do you ever feel for the people you're dating at, at the time? Um, do you, do you ever kind of feel like, you know, they, they're, they're done, right? I mean, technically, you're going to pull the rug out from under them ultimately. And, and, and they are, they're finished. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, it's a great question. And I mean, I really empathize with, with, or I at least try to empathize with the subjects that, you know, became part of the stories that um, I had done at Project Veritas and at O'Keefe Media Group, you know, so um I mean, to answer your question, like, I mean, I, I look at this Jordan Walker story and I mean, I feel like that he, he's demoralized most likely in, in, in he, his life. I mean, I'm not going to say his life is destroyed, but, um, you know, I mean, there were memes going all over the internet with him and James and the whole thing. And in like, to me, like the reality of the situation is that this story was so blown out of proportion as to like the importance of it you know like people at project veritas were calling it the most important story ever matt tiermond james they both were saying that i don't know the fact that th it happened to jordan it could have been anybody but to like blame him for like the crimes against humanity that we were seeing roll out you know, I mean, that, and that's not even what the story is about necessarily. Um, like the crimes against humanity are like just the toxic poison bomb itself going into people's arms and causing like mass genocide slash injury slash death. You know, like that's that's what was playing out. And so, you know, this whole thing was really just about the virus mutating kind of. And so, you know, it was more of like a look this way and let's blame this guy, Jordan Walker when the reality of the situation is like the evildoers are, you know, all the executives and in the people above the executives, like, so he's a tool. Yes, absolutely. And so, I mean, is there anything that I can do like other than feel bad for the guy? I mean, like, you know, I just, you know, because I mean, have you talked to him? No, no. And I, I'm just, you know, maybe I'm too empathetic, but you know, he's somebody who he thinks he's on a date and it turns out it's with somebody who's not even gay, you know, so he, he, he's not going on a date just to say for giggles. He's doing it three times. So I assume he's thinking, hey, this, I, I feel good about this, you know, this possible, there could be a relationship. And, and that has to weigh on you. Have you 
have you ever not exposed somebody just because you're like, you know what, this will harm them more than will benefit the world with the information I'm getting? Have you ever done that or just said, never mind, spike this one? Yeah, there was a situation where I was at OMG um, where I had went out with somebody and I won't say the gender, it could be man, it could be woman, leave it vague, you know, but this person, um, you know, I won't even say anything about job title or anything, but yes, they were, they were more on the conservative leaning side, it seemed. And they were talking about like DEI and how like, you know, the government has like cutting off our, you know, boys' penises and things of that nature, like with the DEI agenda and just in general, bad talking Joe Biden. And, you know, to hear it from like somebody that, you know, from this person was definitely really interesting, but um, it would have probably put them in an interesting spot to say the least, uh, like with their role. And so, I mean, it didn't come from me. James didn't want to release the information and didn't think it was strong enough. So, Oh, interesting. So James himself spikes some of these or is selective. And that is part of your whistleblowing, right? Is you feel like not this specific case, but you feel like he may be too discerning with what he releases or too much of a curator. I'm, I'm curious how, how you would describe it. In a way, yes, absolutely. I mean, the whole thing, Eric, with like my original whistleblower situation of being a Pfizer scientist, right? I knew there was so much wrongdoing happening. And like my testimony itself, like forget about the recordings and everything, like to just interview me and ask me about what was happening at Pfizer and to allow me to have a testimony through Project Veritas and speak on like the mRNA vaccine platform and explain how we, the, you know, as mankind were getting duped, you know, that would have been powerful enough to increase vaccine hesitancy on a worldwide scale. Um, but I mean, they wanted me to do all these other things. You know, I, I just said when I originally emailed them, like, I want to help, I want to be a whistleblower. And then like, they, gave me this equipment they have me do all this recording obtaining information and then like pull the rug out from under me after working my butt off for two and a half months on a story that was literally so powerful that like could have saved millions of lives you know so the were there other that, stories though from other people that you know of that were also spiked if you will even after a, a lot of work yes so I mean, in, in my situation, I was definitely a very unique situation and the timing of my situation was also just like unprecedented and like people look at my story, like Stu Peters and all these people that I've interviewed with, I've gotten 99.9% .9 feedback and people are like, how did James not release this? You know? And so like, whether, you know, you want to talk about like legalities or not, like the reality of the situation is that, you know, your motto is be brave, do something. And you had this whistleblower give this massive story to you and you didn't want to release it. Did, so. did, did all this kind of overlap his um, leaving, being fired, you know, the drama um, between him? That was him. about a year after. That was about a year after my whistleblower experience. And so it was after the whole him leaving was from the whole Pfizer um, directed evolution story. It happened like a month after or so. Um, so that, that was connected to it. And I mean, James has even said that like the board was like corrupted by Pfizer potentially. And I just, I don't know, I, it's hard to prove that, um, you know, I mean, from my position, at least, um, when I went to O'Keefe media group, eventually, you know, when we we're talking about the whole board fiasco, like I kind of saw it as like a charade in a sense, it felt like it was. It felt like a charade, but I don't know. You know, I mean, 16, 17 people signed a letter signing, saying like, hey, we have these, you know, disagreements with James. And I mean, some of it was definitely valid. Um, you know, I mean, they were calling James like, you know, the he he's exactly who we, he pontificates on who we should be exposing in a sense of, um, you know, like 
I mean, James is not the easiest person to work for. He expects like, you know, 150% out of you. And if you're not getting results, like he, like the turnover rate at Project Veritas was very high. You know, like a lot of people were there like six months, a year. Was this a, was this abusive or just he's a, a hard taskmaster? Um, I mean, it depends on who you ask, I think. You know, from my perspective, he's definitely a taskmaster. He expects the most out of um, who is working for him. But some of it is, I don't want to, like, on the record say, like, I mean, it abusive. But, like, there was, there were situations, like, I mean, there was a situation where I went on a meeting with a uh, assistant superintendent. And there was a journalism call. You know, all the journalists got on the same call and I basically got singled out for an hour, like right before I had a, my meeting uh, with this person. And so, you know, my field ops director, Jitsu, like I talked to him after and explained like what happened after my meeting. And like James was putting so much pressure on me to like perform and to get a second meeting and to like make sure that you get a story type stuff like you need a story. You know, like make sure you get that, and if you don't, don't come back. Is what it sounds he's like sales almost like always be selling. Like you've got to close this deal, or is that a fair? Well, and that's the thing, and I mean, if there is no story, there's not going to be a story. You know, there, if if and yes, we were working from a tip, so like we knew that something was potentially up in this situation, and it was up to me to go get that story right. But if you're like demanding a story then what are you doing too? You know, like, are you like, are you just searching for clickbait stuff or are you like actually doing investigative journalism? And so that was at Project Veritas. And so, um, you know, the whole board fiasco happens and James ends up leaving. I was offered a role at O'Keefe Media Group through a COO that he had just hired. I got on the phone with them. I was basically offered the position and I basically had to resign from PV immediately and so i resigned a few days after like once my ed camp story had finished um which was my story in long island it was a three-part series and it was really successful i mean it it was organic jor journalism exposing a i mean you could call it a cabal of like superintendents and educators uh around nassau county in long island that um used this ed camp it's a professional development um, educational like program called EdCamp. It's nationwide and they use it as a free PD to, you know, slip in some like diversity, equity, inclusion slash like LGBTQ agenda almost. Um, and so that's what that story is about. You guys can, you know, the audience can go watch it. I don't need to elaborate. Oh, for sure. A question on that though. Um, it just kind of struck me. You followed O'Keefe out but you had mentioned that you started to work for Project Veritas and and got the position to try to get a hold of all the material you had collected. Does that mean that he had the material, so you followed him to get the material, or were you turning away from the possibility of getting the material, which may have sat there at Project Veritas? So after the Jordan Walker story, I reobtained some of my information i didn't get all of it back and some of it's still technically on a hard drive um but right after the jordan walker it was a quid pro quo situation in the sense of i gave them this massive story so now i have great rapport with not only james but like leadership and everyone like you know trusted me they're like oh my god he's he's brilliant you know and um so that happens and then almost I, like it was a date with them yeah. So I I had well James and the team, the leadership team, James especially wanted to do a follow up on Pfizer. And so they literally said like, "Oh, like and my code name was Bam," right? They they said, "Oh, like let's let's re look at Bam's undercover footage from when he was a Pfizer scientist." So they re thought about it. Let me and guess. So, so they give it to you saying, hey, go through this stuff and see if you can put something together or anything. No, like they that. didn't give it to me. They didn't include me in those meetings. They, oh, okay. I, I got it through one of the journalists that was part of the leadership team. Mm. 
um, where they were reconsidering it and they sent me the information um, through Telegram and I just like screen recorded and reobtained it, you know, and, okay. and that was one of the insider footage things that was included in the documentary with Conwall. Um, and then I reobtained more on uh, actually when I went to O'Keefe Media Group, the first day on the job, I got more information back. So it was just a divine intervention from God truly is how I look at this and how I reobtained it because it was like miracle one and then miracle two. And then putting it all together is a miracle in itself. You know, Project Whistleblower, I'm not the only whistleblower in the story. There's Kim Witzak from the FDA, who is on the Psychopharmacologic uh, Drug Safety Committee as a consumer rep um, for for the FDA. And she has an incredible story where, you know, she became an accidental advocate and she has this story on Chantix and uh, Zoloft. I mean, Zoloft ended up like killing her husband. Basically. Chantix, is that the anti-smoking? Yes. So I've heard her, that there's anger issues with that or some yeah, variant. So that's what she wanted to basically make sure it was known. Um, and with Chantix, there was a black box warning that was on this drug for years. Like it was approved in the early 2000s, I think 2003, 2004. And there was a black box warning for what you're saying, violence and associated risk of like violence and just maybe even suicide. You know, her situation is that she was on the committee that was supposed to vote on this black box warning actually. And this is the first time like an unprecedented situation back in 2016, 2017, where she was part of this committee and it's her job to make sure that there's consumer safety, in, you know, considered for the situation at hand. And she was taken off of the vote. And so she was like the only person on the committee that was really going to be advocating for patient safety. So she flew to D.C. anyways to like advocate for the safety and speak on the fact that Pfizer had paid off like $250 million of Chantix like victims, you know, people that had suffered from taking Chantix. And so they removed the black box warning regardless. This is the first time it ever happened. And then within a two-year time span of that happening from 2016 to 2018, Pfizer saw nearly a billion dollars in revenue, like increase in Chantix. It's like taking the label off of cigarettes? Yes, exactly. Perfect metaphor. I stayed in contact with her for like nine, 10 months while she was just like sitting on this information. But she was like, I got to do an interview with someone else if I'm not going to do it with, with James. So she ended up doing it on Redacted. Um, so I'm glad that she got to tell her story that way. Um, and then the other whistleblower, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, it, so justintegrity.net is, are you essentially now a competitor of uh, OMG? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking to do investigative journalism, but I mean, the, the justintegrity.net platform, I'm looking to turn into like a journalism association of like trustworthy independent journalists and uh, create like a privatized um, co-op kind of. Um, what do you mean by co-op? Um, well, I hate to say best thing I can think of is a farmer's market. Everybody shows up and they sell their wares and <laughs> it's under the umbrella of, you know, the people that come to the market in a sense uh if you have a bunch of independents that are kind of getting together under an umbrella and people are donating to that and you're all somehow splitting the proceeds, I, I don't know. Something like that. It's still very new. You know, I mean, I don't have like an entity formed or anything like that right now. I'm just, I, I created justintegrity.net. It's a playoff of my name and I'm, you know, standing in integrity and looking to turn it into an investigative journalism as well as like a wellness platform um, and, and, you know, do podcasting like yourself, do, do investigative journalism, like big stories where like whistleblowers can come to me, you know, and trust me based off of 
what I stand for, which is, you know, truth and love of, of mankind. Does this mean uh, that you're looking to get behind the scenes more versus um, in front of the scenes? I, I mean, you're getting out there, you're doing interviews, people are going to watch this, that makes you less likely to be successful in an undercover date. I'm not necessarily like looking to do undercover journalism anymore. Not going to lie. I mean, it, it takes a lot on, on your mental, like, you know, you got to be mentally strong. You got to literally be comfortable, like lying for two hours on a meeting, like about your entire life, you know, and, and you're hurting people. And bottom line. Yes. So you know, I mean, hurting them how badly, you know, you got to weigh that. But Well, it's Machiavellian. I mean, let, let's just say you are in an ends justify the means scenario. And those means can be rough, dude. They can be really rough. I won't disagree with you. Um, and then, so there was one other whistleblower story that I told um, for Raymond Bichard. And so this this gentleman, he is an investigative journalist as well. Uh, he, you know, or, you know, just call him a journalist and he is also a human rights advocate and he has successfully been doing human trafficking work for over the last, you know, he's been doing it for a long time, like 20, 25 years, I think. Um, and so he successfully did this, uh, petition for Facebook slash meta, um, in 2012, I believe 2011, 2012, where he got 400,000 signatures and over like 1.2 million people to follow a movement that he created called, you know, just get it, getting child porn off of Facebook, which is really important. And, you know, from a lot of people's eyes, you know, unless you're a pastor. Um, and so, you know, he, he outlined how the whole thing was working on meta and just, you know, successfully did this. And, you know, he's also been on like the Congress floor fighting for human rights advocates uh, as a human rights advocate for, for kids and for human trafficking. Um, and so, you know, I connected with Raymond uh, while I was working at O'Keefe Media Group and he had this Twitter story, uh, you know, and it was after Elon had taken over the company and he had discovered that Twitter is a, a open source forum almost where like it used to be on on craigslist like this this point B and and uh i think he says back page or something but i'm not really no, sure, i think but. yeah i think that craigslist they used to hire prostitutes and things like that so that might have shifted over and there's some darkness so, there craigslist it went off of craigslist and raymond was like all right well where did it go and so he started uh taking the search filter off of Twitter, like the safety search. And once you do that and you start using certain hashtags, you can find pornography in general, but you can also find like what is a, a, a grounds for child abuse and child endangerment at the very least, you know, because like seven year olds can technically like create a Twitter account and, and take the search filter off and then boom, find these, find these, uh, you know, outlandish, crazy search terms, but if they find it, then they could become victims. And Raymond has done heavy research into this and found like literal screenshots and pictures of like women being abused and like kids like being tied up on a tree and saying, Dada tied me up on a tree and, you know, made sure, you know, told me that like my next victim or, you know, my next whatever is going to come get me or, you know, or mom has, you know, a nice two-year-old for, for Dada or whatever. And it's just like insane stuff, you know, that this was presented. Um, and the other journalists at O'Keefe Media Group thought that this was a story too. And so Raymond sat down with James for like a 35, 40-minute interview and they cut the whole thing up. And then James was like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't no no story of real substance um, and just didn't want to release it. And um, I thought it was interesting that he had to say that because I mean, I know he, he has like some sort of relationship with Elon Musk and like he wanted, like, I guess he didn't want to like 
Dora the optics of that situation. And I mean, what Raymond is saying is very important in the sense of like, this has been happening before Elon, you know, this has been happening for years. That was part of supposedly Elon was going to be addressing that when he took over. He, I believe, made public tweets to that effect that, you know, when I take over, we're, we're knocking this off. It, it, it's it's going to stop. Um, I always like to wrap up with the following question, which I'm almost afraid to ask you because I have a feeling it's well loaded. But it is, and I'm going to do a variant of it. What is the one question that you've been doing a bunch of interviews and you're like, why the hell aren't these people asking me this question? What is that question? Or like, what were your initial thoughts when you found out that James O'Keefe was going to the Bohemian Grove as a guest? I mean, I mean, the answer to that is like my whole world like flipped upside down. Not that it wasn't already upside down, but like it was just another like it was whipped cream with cherry on top at that point um, when I uncovered that James was invited as a guest to go to Bohemian Grove. And it was just, you know, there's so much unknown with him going still. Um, but, you know, I'm the first person ever to confirm him going. And it's just, it's very ripe for conspiracy. We'll leave it at that, Eric, because, I mean, Alex Jones is friendly with James and has been since 2003 talking about how Bohemian Grove is like this satanic pile cult that they use as blackmail and and just like really dark stuff is what is conspired that happens there. Yeah, he went there with John Ronson undercover uh, famously. Um, yes. Yeah, so, have you like heard the term is, limited hangout? In the sense of like limited hangout is what the Bohemian Grove is? Do you fear that James O'Keefe is a limited hangout, a CIA agent or somebody working with the CIA that is acting in a manner as if they are with somebody or they're representing something, but they, in fact, are, it's a limited hangout. That's what the term is. Um, I think it's possible. Um, and to touch on that, I mean, we could, you know, I mean, I don't know if you know who Eric Prince is, but he's yes, part Blackwater. of Blackwater. Blackwater and so Blackwater was connected to Project Veritas actually in like I forget the year but I mean I've connected with people from Project Veritas in the past and Eric Prince had a hand in training Project Veritas undercover journalists slash operatives like infiltrating elections and things of that nature you know way before I even knew what Project Veritas was right this was happening from 2012 2016 2018, 2019, it was happening for years. Um, so is is James a limited hangout? Like I can't necessarily like affirm that yes, he is. Like I'm not I can't say like literally, yes, James is in the CIA, but Eric Prince is connected, I believe, as an ex CIA intelligence asset. And so if he is part of that and you know, he was apparently recruiting spies to work in Project Veritas, you know. Is that not a private military intelligence like contract almost like of of like aiding and abetting almost like, you know, your intelligence turning Project Veritas into an intelligence operation in a sense, like through a nonprofit organization? Is that what was happening? Because it's it's entire it's a it's a conspiracy that could potentially be proven. It's just, you know, not enough people are talking about it and asking the questions about it. But um you know, that that is entirely real. And I mean, Eric Prince is still connected to James today. Um, he just did a story on like he brought up Eric Prince during his meeting with this guy from uh, the DOD. Aiden Gray is his name or uh, that might be his alias name. But Aiden Gray, he's asking this guy, Aiden Gray, who, you know, apparently had bottom surgery. Who knows? But I don't know. I just roll my eyes at that. But he brought up Eric Prince during this meeting. And like, is that a coincidence? Like James is connected to Eric Prince and is proven to have been connected to Eric Prince. And I don't know. I'm just raising questions. Like how did, why did, how and why did James bring up Eric Prince in a meeting with the DOD and talk about these contracts that um, this guy, Aiden Gray might be preventing Eric Prince from having, 
He also talks about Eric Prince. Eric Prince, former Navy SEAL, founded a company called Blackwater, known as a PMC, a private military contractor. You know, so I don't know. It's just it's like I said, ripe for conspiracy um, with what is happening. You know, is is James limited hangout? I don't have evidence of that necessarily. But um, I mean, there there's another whistleblower, Patrick Berge, who uh, blew the whistle from the DOD and explains uh, what internet, eh, excuse me, IIA operations or interactive internet activities where I mean, what we're doing right now is part of IIA operations where we're just, you know, doing a podcast. Um, but, you know, it depends on how big these things get, how controlled, limited release, limited hangouts, like you're saying, um, these things can get. Um, so Patrick Berge blew the whistle on like Pandora Papers and and uh, the D DOD and explains how the DOD is using government contractors essentially as like in the media in a way right so i mean Shadow i don't date, have proof right? of that i don't have proof that james is a government contractor through the dod but i mean there are other whistleblowers who have made these claims and so you know i connect the dots in the film in a way that it, it could make sense for all of that to add up Okay, well, we will keep an eye on everything, and I have a feeling that you may have more to share with us in the future since you're continuing with this type of thing, and thank you very much. Thanks for having me on, Eric, and for the audience who hasn't seen it yet, Project Whistleblower Volumes 1 and 2 can be found at justintegrity.net, um, and you can also find it on Rumble, on BitChute. I have all the links uh, attached to my website. Again, justintegrity.net. And if you guys would like to support me, um, I haven't necessarily been working. Uh, I've been doing full time just putting this documentary together. So I created a gift send go um, where, you know, if you'd like to donate to me, uh, I greatly appreciate anything that you can give me. Um, and if you can't give, I'm also reading every single prayer. Like they have a prayer button, which I think is awesome. So I, I go through all the prayers that people send me. Um, and, you know, if you feel called to share it, just just share it so that more people can see it. And there will be a link in the description to justintegrity.net. So just look below, click, and thank you very much.